Okay, welcome back to class number six on our series on Stranger. Today we're going to focus on Sefer Devarim. Um, and I'll share my screen. And here's our source sheet. There we go. Um, we're going to go back to our breath. Devarim more than any other book, 22 times, almost as much as a little more than by Ikra. We're going to find the Sefer Devarim that I'm going to try and explain that the Ger in Sefer Devarim is almost always talking about someone who has not even converted. It doesn't mean that the Ger converted, he won't have the rights, but we're going to find that in Sefer Devarim to be many obligations that we have for the stranger, be it a stranger who converted or not converted, Ger Tzedek or Ger Tosha, that's what we're going to try to prove today. And we're not going to find any obligations of the stranger himself. There might be one at the end, which we have to talk about. Now, I have to begin by explaining why that is, that Sefer Devarim talks about our obligations to the stranger and not the obligations of the stranger. Again, our main uh, distinction we made in every single class is that when you go to Rukhamesh, my contention is, is that whenever there's an obligation of the stranger, something he has to do, he's obligated to do, it's talking about a gear converted, what we call a gear and set it. When it's talking about our obligation to a gear, it's referring to even someone who hasn't converted, a gear toshav and kava chomer, a gear set it. So we have 22 times in Sefer Devarim. The first one, um, to appreciate it, I need to review what Sefer Devarim, we've done a whole series on it before, but I want to review the key points. And I want to explain why it makes sense that Sefer Devarim is talking about our obligation to the stranger as opposed to the obligation of the stranger. Remember, Sefer Dvarim is a set of laws, not a review of the first four books of Chumash, as is often misunderstood, but rather it's a set of laws that Moshe received together with the Ten Commandments on the first 40 days on Har Sinai that he teaches over and over again, called Mishneh Torah. Those laws are so important, they need constant repetition, Vishnantam Gavanecha. And they're so important, they have their own book. Moshe taught them the first time when he came down from Har Sinai, but couldn't teach him until after the sin of the golden calf was solved. And therefore, only after we get the second Nuchot is Moshe able to teach them. And therefore, Sefer Shmo talks about the sin and reconvening the covenant and the symbol of the covenant that we never find out in Sefer Shmo what laws Moshe received on Har Sinai in the first 40 days. We don't find about them. We don't find out about them in Vayikra or Babidmar either. In Sefer Devarim, Moshe is going to repeat them something that he's told the people many times, but the reader of Chumash never saw, and he's going to review them one last time before um, he passes on, and Am Yisrael passes over the Jordan and conquers Israel. Now, the first four chapters of the speech is this interactive speech, sort of a pep talk, why it's been 40 years, and to make sure, encourage them so it shouldn't happen again. Therefore, he explains about the sin of the spies, what the people did wrong, and how God's helped them so far. And then the main speech is going to start in chapter 5, with the Brit Sinai, the Covenant of Sinai, and the Ten Commandments, then all the laws from chapter 6 through 26, they came with the Ten Commandments, they divide into two sections, the Mitzvah section, which is loving God and fearing God, that begins with Shema and ends with Bayim Shema, and the Chukim Mishpatim section, the main law section from chapters 12 to 26, which are laws of day-to-day -day life, but primarily laws that deal not only with individual behavior, but national behavior. Um, let me take a quick break and put on the mute. I'm gonna mute everybody. And then, if you want to say something, be more than happy to participate. Participants and all. Oh, okay. So, to appreciate what we're going to go through in Sefer Dvarim, I have to identify the key sections of Dvarim and how the laws in Sefer Dvarim reflect the Ten Commandments. I'll just go to our um, outline from our earlier share not in this series, in a previous series, that um, the mitzvah section is primarily an application of the first two statements of the Ten Commandments, loving God and not serving other gods. So, it's like, loving God and not serving other gods, repeated over and over again from different angles. That's in chapter 6 through 11. Uh, but it's primarily about our attitude and our relationship with God. We're more practical laws in in setting up a nation, we're going to find out from chapter 12 to 26. Chapter 12, we have setting up the Beit HaMikdash, uh, followed by the Shemitah cycle, things relating to seven, relating to Shabbat. 
um, and, and the holidays. Then we have national leadership parallel to honoring parents. Then we have laws of going to war, and then miscellaneous laws about men and fellow men that include like marriage laws and divorce laws that go to voting up and laws of the marketplace um, that have to do with voting no, you know, and finally caring about others, you know, not to covet what doesn't belong to you. Now, just as a reminder, the speech, the main speech began with Moshe calls all the people together before he dies in the 40th year. He says, Shema Yisrael, listen up to the laws I'm teaching you today. And they're part of a covenant that God made with us at Har Sinai. Followed by the mitzvah section, the story of the Ten Commandments, why they got scared and why Moshe teaches them afterwards and why they have to be repeated. Followed by the mitzvah section, loving God and fearing God. And, and then followed by the practical laws. And the conclusion, which proves it's about Har Sinai, which is important for today's share, just review the conclusion. Moshe tells him at the end, this day of the speech, God's commanding you these laws that I'm teaching you. I'm teaching them, but God commanded them. Keep them with the right attitude. And then we have the famous exchange of vows, sort of, that you took upon yourself that, that Hashem will be your God. That was written in love. You'll walk in his ways. That's the story of stone to do tzedek of Mishpat. Hashem. To keep his laws, all the rest of the laws of Hamish, and to obey God, that's Brit Sinai, and Shemot Yishmun Bukhali. In fact, God took upon himself that you'll be his Amskula, like he told you at Har Sinai, that um, we can be Skula Mikolamin, to keep all of his laws, and that'll put you in a leadership position above the nations to glorify and sanctify God's name. And then you'll be a nation separated in the service of God if you fill these mitzvot properly. Now, that speech is concludes with a blessing and curse if you keep the laws or if you don't keep the laws. Another brief in a mitzavim, which makes this covenant eternal, binding on all generations. And then the final blessings of Moshe to the tribes and mitzvah hakel at the end of the book. And we're going to see gear in each of these sections. Okay, so that's the background. That was a review of Sefer Devarim. Now we're going to see what's in Sefer Devarim. Let me check if there's any questions so far. So I have to share and check the chat. That's empty. Okay. Sounds okay now, I hope. Thumbs up already. So yes. Very good. Okay. Um, I'll share one more time before I share. I'll share this source seat one last time for those who came in a little bit late. And we're going to get to work. The very first one is going to be uh, in the first chapter. Remember, before Moshe tells the story of the spies, he tells the story of appointing judges uh, and getting the people ready for their journey and what happened 40 years ago and what's happening now. So in the end of the first chapter, before he gets to the stories of the spies, he says as follows. Remember, he tells the story how Moshe said, I can't do this all myself. And he points um, a step that's going to help him. So at the end of, the, uh, of that section, Moshe says as follows. But Sabeh Shoftechem Beitelemor, 40 years ago when we were leaving Har Sinai, and I set aside Shoftim to help me you know, lead the people. I commanded them at that time, saying, Shemoa ben Achichem ushpatatem tzedek ben ish u ben Achibu ben Gero. I have leadership now that's going to help Moshe Rabbeinu lead the people, be judges and leaders. And I commanded them, listen to the disputes between the different people and the job of the stranger Remember Moshe is saying, I can't take all of you arguing. I'll do it by, all by myself. I need people to help me judge and solve problems within the camp. And therefore, he tells his helpers, the Shoftim, we're going to assist them now and lead with them. Ushpatzim Tzedek, make sure to judge the Tzedek between Ish and Achib and Ben Giro. Now, unclear in the, in the simple meaning, is this a comfort or not? But since we're just leaving Egypt, it could be anybody who, who remember when we left Egypt, a lot of people, Arab rock followed us and there could have been strangers that came along with us. But Moshe Rabbeinu is, is emphasizing that when a judge judges people, goes through disputes and tries to lead, make sure that you judge properly with justice between every man and fellow man, as well with strangers. Meaning, don't just because someone's a stranger doesn't mean he has, doesn't have equal opportunity to a fair trial or fair judgment. So there we see again an emphasis on tzedek 
justice and taking care of the stranger. Again, we can't tell from this pasuk alone whether it's Jewish or not Jewish, but we saw so far that a ger, someone who's a stranger in the community, and we're going to see it includes even someone not Jewish in the rest of the book. Now, the next time we have gears in the Ten Commandments, I'm only going to mention it. The number here, 48, that's, how many, that's in the program, how many times the word gear is mentioned. This is the 48th time in Chumash here in the garden. Now, on Shabbat, it's on Yom Hashvi Shabbat HaShemel Kepha, as we all know, you can't do any work. You and your son and your daughter, your servant and your maidservant, and your animals, all your animals, and the gear that's in your gates. So that why? So that you and your workers, so your workers have a day of rest just like you. Now, who is this scare? If he's Jewish, if he's a convert, of course he has to keep Shabbat. Why would you think he does have to keep Shabbat? Therefore, in simple Shabbat, is, it's talking about someone not Jewish. And it's not that he can't do work. This isn't telling the gear that he can't do work. It's telling you he can't do work for you. In other words, you don't do any work. You, you know, for sure in your family, your servants, Okay? And your animals, basically, you can't work and you can make other people work because what's the reason at the end? Everyone deserves a day of rest so that your workers need a day of rest. So if you have a stranger living in your country, even if he's not Jewish, he also deserves a day of rest. That doesn't mean that he can't do malacha for himself, but he wants to do what he can do his own on Shabbat, but he can't work for you. Now, how's that? how do we deal with the Shabbos going? Ask your local rabbi. But in simple shot here is that on Shabbat, um, that we're not saying that the ger can't do work, but he can't do work for you. That's why it's ger, your ger in your midst. He can't work for you like your servants can't work for you because everyone deserves a day of rest. If he wants to work on his own, that's his problem. That's why when a, when a non-Jew does something for you, he has to be doing it for himself as well as for you. But then again, that's a complicated halachic sugya. So that's the first two times we have it. And that's again, we're going to um, dedicate a whole share next week to a, a, a massive argument about how to understand this plastic in the Ten Commandments, uh, and that one, and also in Parsha Mishpatim, which will shed light on our whole discussion. Okay. Now we get to the main part of the speech, the mitzvah section. I'm going to spend time on chapter 10 because chapter 10 is critical to understanding um, the key theme of Mamad Har Sinai. Remember, the laws in Devarim are coming together with the Ten Commandments, explaining to Amish Surah why they're chosen. In the middle of the first section, smack in the middle between Shema and Shema, we have one of the most fundamental questions in Chomesh that Moshe is dealing with. Vata Yisra. Moshe says, now, Israel, listen up. Ma Hashem Elokecha Shomimcha. What is it that God wants from you? Simple question, right? Bottom line, what does God want from his people? What does he want from you? So, there's a nice little list here. Kim Lirat Hashem Elokecha. Number one, to fear God. Number two, to follow his ways. We proved before that's doing Tzedek and Mishpat from the story of Stom in Avram. And to love God and serve him with all your heart and all your might. Basically, total dedication to God. It's not that God's working for you, you're working for God. What does God want from you? Basically, total dedication, walking in his ways, emulating God. Now, what does that mean? Davening all day long? bringing sacrifices, praying, or we'll see in a minute what that includes. Okay. So to keep to keep the laws of God that is commanding you now in Sefer Zvarim, and the statutes, which is commanding you today, and it's for your own good, and he goes on and on why you picked us. After that quick explanation, Moshe explains in details. And it tries to mean, what does it mean, what does it mean to emulate God, to walk in his ways? What are the ways of God? He says as follows. You're God, the God who took you out of Egypt. Remember, the God who chose you, the God who you entered this covenant with. He's the one and only God. He's this one and only God, strongest of them all, okay? who doesn't play favors. He doesn't take bribes. You can't buy this God off with food, with sacrifices, with prayer. This is the God of justice who's in charge. But this God is just, and you can't bribe him. Okay. What does God do? Listen carefully. God does justice and takes care of the orphan and the widow. But God loves the stranger, giving him clothing and food. 
Now, the question is going to be, how does God take care of the stranger, give him love and food? The answer is the next line. You have to love the stranger. And if you put these two people next to each other, we see a beautiful definition of what it means to emulate God. Because how does God love the stranger? By giving us the ability to help the stranger. So we have to say, it says here, but God loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. And then in the next time we're commanded, we have to do it. Now, if Pasuk Yotchet, the verse 18, is talking about what God does, then if, if we just say that God takes care of the stranger, why are we getting involved? A lack, don't we have the movement that God can take care? But of course, we, hold, we have to take care of the stranger. And what Chumash, I think, is saying, the way that God takes care of the stranger is by giving us the ability to take care of the stranger. So if we give food and clothing to the stranger, how about the less fortunate, the orphan, the widow, etc.? That's the manner that God does it. So if we're in this, not just a relationship, but a partnership with God, and we emulate God, the lechem bedrachav, we said in the beginning, walking in his ways, then the way we serve God, the way we love God, is by loving those who are in need. And then if God blesses us with the ability to help this less fortunate, the way that God helps those people is by giving us the ability to do it. And then we become a partner with God. We'll see this thing later again in Sefer Dvarim over and over again. And therefore, Hashem Elkech, Hashem your God, who chose you. Remember, remember, Hashem Yisra, Hashem Elkechem, Hashem Echad, Hashem your God, your boss, who chose you. He's the one and only God. So this God, you have to fear him, serve him, cling to him, and swear by his name. So this is like setting the stage for how we have to act in our society. Again, that's in the first section. In the Mitzvah section, it's defining a relationship with God. And that's the main time we have it in, the, in that chapter 6 to 11 that begins with Shema and with Bayim Shema. But it's not just a Pasuk. It's a key Pasuk that's defining a whole relationship with God. Now, it's unclear again up until now whether the Ger and Sefer Torah is Jewish or not Jewish. But in chapter 14, where we have the laws of what we can eat, what we can't eat, so machalot asurot, what animals we can eat, what animals we don't eat, etc. Or it says you can't eat in the vela, an animal that wasn't checked it properly. It's forbidden to eat. But what do you do with it? You give an vela to the ger in your midst. That proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that whenever it says ger asher bisharecha in Sefer Dvarim, it's not Jewish. Now, in logic, it's like every other time it says ger asher bisharecha. Because they can't be Jewish. If, if we're not allowed to eat in the Vela, why would we feed it to a, um, to a ger who's Jewish? But it has to be a ger toshav. So you either gift it to him or you um, sell it to an Ochri. Now, there's a great sugya, I think we mentioned it before, where um, is it permitted to sell it to a stranger or does it have to gift it? Or is it permitted to gift it to a Nukhri? A Nukhri is a foreigner, someone not living in your country, someone just visiting from the outside, for sure not Jewish, but not a, re not a resident, just someone visiting, a tourist or a businessman coming by. And why do we have to, why do we have to gift it to the, to the stranger? I think if it's our commandment to gift it, not charge them for it, like do them a favor, why? Right? That's Har Sinai, because your nation separated to serve God. And this is a reflection of the way you serve God by helping the gift. So the nimuk, the, um, the reasoning behind it, relates to the essence of Har Sinai. Remember, that was the Greek we made in Har Sinai. Because your nation is separated in the service of God, and that's how God takes care of the stranger, even a non Jewish stranger. Uh, therefore, this little add-on at the end is very meaningful. Again, that's the first time we find it in the Chukim Shpatim section. Now, uh, in chapter 15, or later in chapter 14, we have um, the loss of the cycle, the three-year cycle. Two years, you take your master and you eat it in Yerushalayim. And every third year, that same 10% is called Maser Ani, you give it to the poor. So in the year of Maser Ani, in years three and six, what do we say? The Levite, okay, who doesn't own land, okay? and the Geri Yatom and Amana, this whole group, those go together, the stranger, the orphan, the widow, the people who don't have land or don't have the same resources, who's in your midst, they come and eat it, you feed it to them, 
and they should be satiated, have enough to eat. And by doing that, God will continue to bless you with everything you're doing, meaning if you use your prosperity properly, God will continue to bless you because you become his trustee. So if God sees that you take your wealth and prosperity and use it properly and use it to sanctify God and by helping your members in your society, God will continue to bless you. And that theme again repeats itself over and over again in sacred volume. And this is a great example of it. Now, then we have the famous Sholosh Vagalim in chapter 16 that we read on the second day of all the time. And on the holiday of Shavuot and Sukkot, we have the famous commandment of you know, rejoicing on the holiday. It's not that you have to be happy, but you have to make others happy. So in Shavuot, what does it say? You, you know, who has to be happy on the holiday on Shavuot and you're, when you're celebrating your grain harvest, then you finish your grain harvest, seven weeks of grain harvest and you're happy. That's the grain that's going to keep you going for the next 10 months. So who has to be happy? You and your children and your family. And also your servant, maid servant, and the Levite who's in your midst and the stranger, the orphan, the widow, also in your midst. And you will rejoice in front of God in your Shalom. But uh, the way we explained it is that not just you have to be happy, you have to make others happy. <clears throat> That's the way Rashi explains it. That's why the Rambam explains it as well in Hilchot Yom Tov in chapter six. He says, this verse here, it's because it's grain harvest and you're happy because you're a farmer. People who don't own land are not as happy. And therefore, the way you thank God for your happiness is making people who are less happy, making them happy. Who's the list? The Levite, who doesn't own land. Therefore, he has nothing to be happy about in a grain harvest. The stranger, the orphan, the widow, <coughs> they're all the people who during grain harvest had no advantage, <coughs> like the farmer who's bringing it all as well. And therefore, you're in the midst of your happiness. You finish your grain harvest, share with those who don't have grain, who don't have land. And the same thing with the fruit harvest in Chag Asif and Sukkot. Remember, the song we sing starts with here. You and your son, the same thing. You, your son, your daughter, and the Levi and the Ger Yotomana Mana. <coughs> the same idea. And here we see that Ger Shebir Kirbecha and Ger Shebir Sharecha is synonymous. In your midst, in your gates, it's the same idea. As opposed to Ger Shebir Tochachem, we explained before that was in Vayikr and Bamibar and Shmot, that's the convert. I want to point out, we don't have that phrase in the learning. So it's, when we're talking about someone who converted, we define that as Ger Shabbat Tochachem. He's in your midst, he's converted. Here, the Ger living in your society, it'll be Ger Shabbat Sharecha, be Kirbecha. Then we see that phrase over and over again, and interchangeably, in separate learning. Now, starting in chapter 23, Parsha Kitetse, we have lots of examples of being a nice, kind, sensitive person in day-to-day -day life. So number one, if there's an Edomite in your land, right, or even an Egyptian, right, don't, don't mistreat them and don't be sick. Why? Because we were once strangers in their land, and therefore they were once nice to us. We have to recognize that and be nice to them. And therefore, no, maybe back then they gave us trouble, but now, generations later, just because of their ancestry, we don't have to hate them. In fact, we were once strangers in their land and they took care of us. So later they might have done something bad to us, but at one time they were good to us. You have to remember that and be kind to strangers when they come to our land. Now that idea, I think we mentioned this before, I just want to emphasize it. What you find so often in world history, when you have a sovereign country and in that sovereign country, you have migrants coming in. Migrants come in because your land is better than theirs. And the people in the strong country, what they call the first world country, um, they'll tend to attract migrants because life is better there. And what, what that country usually does, they take advantage of those migrants because they think they're doing them a favor by giving them a job. So of course they'll pay them less wages. So there's, the second you feel you're doing a favor to a migrant by giving him anything, because he doesn't belong there, he's not part of your country, it's very easy to take advantage of that. Now, that doesn't mean every country has to flood itself with migrants. But once you have a migrant in your country, if you're talking about national policy, letting them in or not, that's a government decision. But every country has to make its own rules and regulations. But should a casual stranger come into your land and it's easy to take advantage of him because he's a migrant, that's what most countries do. 
you can bring lots of examples in ancient history, modern history, almost every country. But if we're God's country and we have migrants like that, we have to go out of way to be nice to them and not to take advantage of them. Again, that doesn't mean that we have 50% of our population, migrants coming from all over, we won't be a Jewish country. But a casual migrant coming in, we have to be extra nice to them. Um, the same thing, if you're hiring somebody, a sahir, you're paying his daily wages, don't take advantage of him. Give him his, his um, salary on time, the right way, and don't take advantage of him. Don't misuse him. Okay? Either the poor person, the avion, from your brethren, or even a stranger, even a, a non-Jew who's in your land. Again, again, Ger Shabbat Sekhu Basharacha is talking about our obligation to a stranger, even if he's not Jewish. And the same thing, go to Temishpat Ger Yatom, the Lot Hapo Beget Amana, the same thing we saw in Parshat Mishpatim, in Sefer Shmot, the same idea. It's easy to mistreat them, make sure not to do that. And then the famous line in chapter 24, um, the Mitzvah of Shichacha, the Mitzvah sort of to forget or pretend to forget. When you're harvesting your field, this is the background to say for to Megillat Ruth. When you're harvesting your field, pretend to leave over, pretend to forget the um, sheaves of grain in your field. Don't go back and pick up every single little piece. Leave it over for the Gary of Mana, so that God should bless you. Again, includes for sure a convert. Because also, probably he doesn't have the, the financial strength because he doesn't own land. As well as the orphan and the widow, basically the less fortunate people, make sure to help them out. And this includes even someone who's not Jewish. And the same thing when you're um, harvesting your, your olives in your, um, in your grapes, what do you do? Leave them for your area So the same thing applies to your wheat, to your olives, and to your grapes. And you see, Kumish is emphasizing this idea over and over again. Now, um, now we get to the end of the speech. It will be as follows. Chapter 26 ends the speech. We saw the, fi the final words of it. The last two mitzvot in Sefer Dvarim um, are proclamations. The first one called um, Mikra Bikurim. When you have your first fruits in the middle of the summer, you bring your first fruits to God and make a proclamation, not thanking God for your fruit, but thanking God for the land and the covenantal purpose of the land. Now, we're all familiar with this because we recite this in, <coughs> in Magi, in our Seder, that becomes a text to how we tell the story of the Exodus. But remember, when you come to land that God's promised your forefathers, and you inherit it, and you conquer it through conquest, and you have an Achalan, you're dwelling in it, basically you've reached this ideal. You're sovereign now in your land. What do you do with your sovereignty? So we take our first fruits that God gives us in the land, and we're going to use it as a token of our appreciation to make a statement to understand why God gave us the land. So we go to Ahamakom HaShayv HaShem, we go to the, to the Beit HaMikdash, the place that God chose to make his name known. We sanctify God by how we act in our city, and we go to this Mikdash to sanctify God's name and his reputation. We go to the Kohen, and we make a statement. What do we say? I'm making the statement to God that Hashem our God, that I'm in this land that you promised our forefathers for a covenantal purpose. It's recognizing not only that he gave us the land, but why he gave us the land. And then, because God promises the land, first in Ben of Tarim, in the covenant of the parts with Abraham and Vino, that before we become a nation, we have to go through suffering and slavery in someone else's land. We thank God for that whole process of history. Therefore, Benita Vamata, you make this proclamation in front of God, you are wandering Armenians, remember? We ended up in Egypt, Yaakov and his family, by Yagosham, we were temporary there, in Egypt, small in number, and we became a nation in Egypt, by Yagosham, the Golgadol. Then what happened? By Yareno, the Egyptians made us a bad one, they made us a bad ones, they began our slavery, they afflicted us, they gave us hard work, remember? And then we cried out to God, and God saved us, we skipped the Tsukim, we know by heart from, from the Seder. And now we make our final proclamation. What do we say? Vata. After setting our history and thanking God for fulfilling Kisad of Ben of Tarim, now I'm presenting because it's a token of my appreciation, the first my first fruits from the land that you gave me. And you present in front of God and bow down. Now, 
The last line is interesting and very important. And here we have the word gera. You have to rejoice in front of God because you're happy that you have fruit, you have land, you're successful. So you rejoice in front of God. Who do you rejoice with? You, the Levite, and the stranger in your midst. Now, up until now it's Sefer Dvarim, we've had the Levite and the stranger together with the Geriot, with the Yotam and Amana, with the offer and the widow. For some reason, when it comes to Bikurim, the Simcha, not like Yom Tov and all the other commandments and all the other mitzvot we had up until now from chapter, in the mitzvahs, in the Chukim Shpatim section, in chapter 14, 15, 22, 23, and 24, we had over and over again, Geri, Yotam, and Amana all together. Together with the Levite. Now we have just the Levite and the Ger. I think that's because we're talking about Bikurim. Bikurim, who's obligated to bring Bikurim? Look again in the beginning. When you come to the land, the what? That God gave you as a Nahala, and you, come, you inherit it, you conquer it, you're sovereign, and you have a Nahala. Who has Nahala? The 12 tribes, or 11 of the 12 tribes. Shevet Levi doesn't have Nahala. Hashem is, is Nahala, therefore he never owns land. He can't bring Bikurim. Um, the Ger is like also doesn't have the Nahala. Remember, a Ger can never become a member of a Shevet. That's why the Ezrach is the member of a Shevet, and the Ger is one who doesn't have a Nahala. And therefore, he can never become an Ezrach. He can buy land and rent land, but he can't own it forever. And therefore, because when everyone else is bringing the Bikurim, these people who can never officially bring Bikurim feel bad, then who do you have to bring in your rejoicing? Make sure to take into consideration the Levi and the Ger, the people who don't own land, and make them, when you bring a Bikurim, make them happy, bring them in and join with them. So they shouldn't feel bad. Then we have um, every three years, the end of the third year and sixth year, where we have Maser Ani, we have to make a statement that we really did Maser Ani. And therefore, remember the two years of the cycle, the first two years, years one and two and four and, 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 four and five, we take the 10% and we eat it in Yerushalayim. And in years three and six, the same food that we eat in Yerushalayim from the fear of God and connect to God, we give to the poor people um, in our midst, you know, in our cities. So at the end of the third year, when you finish taking all your maser from all your produce at the end of the season, in the third year, shanta maser of maser ani, who do you have to give it to? Again, you give it to the Levite, the Gary, your Tom and Amana, the group that we always have all to separate and you give them a tea in the satiating. Then you have to make a proclamation, a declaration that you've done all your responsibilities. What statement do you have to make? It's called Bidui Masrot. Okay. I got rid of things that I had to take out of my house and put out for the for those in need. I gave the Levite, the stranger, the orphan, the widow, exactly as you commanded me. I didn't forget any of my mitzvot. So in these two proclamations at the very end of the speech, but by making proclamations that remind you of your obligation. So if you have to make a proclamation every year that you've done your responsibility helping the orphan, stranger, and widow, in this yearly or try your proclamation you're making, that's gonna have should have a transformative effect on what you do in your day-to-day -day life, and those are the key mitzvot in separate volume. Now that's the end of the mitzvah section. I mean the end of the, the um, main speech, the end of the Chukim Mishpatim section, and that puts the whole speech together and it connects it back to Har Sinai. After that, we have the Tokacha, but the Tokha begins with blessings and curses. Um, that Moshe is going to say, that Moshe tells him to say, when you cross the Jordan River, you go to Hargrizim and Harival, or, or Harival, and you um, have the tribes facing each other. And we look at Hargrizim and give the blessing, and we look at Harival and give the curse. And there's 12 curses we say in the very beginning before the blessings. And one of the, one of the curses is Aror Matem Ishpat Ger Yatom Be'amana. One of the 12 is going to be. Um, Making sure. Now, if you look at, uh, let me open up chapter 27 in, let me check the chat real fast. Oh, wait, let me check the chat before we go any farther. Chat number three. Um, yeah, okay. So, Perakhab Dalad, in all these cases, the Ger refers to a convert and non Jew, exactly. I mean, it's for sure a Ger who's Jewish, but even more so, but, but also a Jew, a convert, I mean, also a stranger who's not Jewish. Um, 
if you rent land and don't own it, you wouldn't be, that's, uh, that's a good thing. You bring Bikurim if you own it, but the, um, again, if, if you, once you buy land and you have Bikurim, you can bring it for sure. But the, the default case, most Gerim don't own land and therefore they won't be able to bring Bikurim. So when Chumash tells you, when in your rejoicing, rejoice with the Levite and, and, the, and the stranger, the, the typical people who don't have land and wouldn't be able to bring Bikurim. That doesn't mean he's put up in Bikurim if he actually buys land, because you can buy land up until the 49 years are over. Anywhere between one and 49 years, you can buy land, but it goes back to its original owner at the end of the over. Um, so if you rent land, you don't bring it? I'm pretty sure you do. I'm almost sure you do. If you rent, if you, if you whatever you own, and if you're a worker in the land, if it doesn't belong to you, if you're just working land, then it's not yours. But if you bought the land, if you can purchase land, but you it just you can purchase it up to 49 years. Because after 49 it goes back. So if you purchased it from somebody, then I guess I'm pretty sure you can bring the Korean. But typically the Gare um, doesn't purchase land. The Levy doesn't need to because he has his Maser. He gets his 10% from Maser Rishon. I guess if the Levy actually purchases land, he can bring the Kurim as well. But typically the Gare and the Levy don't own land. Therefore, they're um, joined together in the in the I'm just suggesting why everywhere else it says Gary Otoma Manat with the Levi. And here we just have the Gary and the Levi together without the Yotoma Manat. I think because by definition, the Gary and the Levi don't have Nahala to start off with, then typically they'll be without a Nahala. And because it's about Nahala with the Korim, we make a big deal about them in the beginning. Um, I said, if you rent, you, got, you don't bring. Oh, good. Very good. But no, I'm saying. Okay, so Milton wrote me that if you rent land, you don't bring the Korean. Very good. That's Mishnah 1, the first tariff, I guess, second Mishnah. Okay, thanks for pointing that out, Milton. We'll open up the Mishnah later in the Korean. Maybe we'll take a look at it in a minute. Let's take a look. Okay, let's open up the Korean. Let's see if Alatar has it. Um, we'll take a quick break. We'll open up our website. We'll go to Alatara. Then we'll get back to the blessings and curses. Let's take a look. Alatorah. We go to Mishnah. We need a Mishnah in Tamud. That's good. Mishnah, Mishnah in Tamud. Can you see my screen, everybody? Um, Mishnah of the Lord. That's a guy. That's the text. Bikurim. Bikurim. First Derek. Okay, Gishmi Vim the Korean, Gishim Jim Korean, Mishnah 2. Okay. Okay. There we go. Let's do the English and Hebrew. English Hebrew. Let me take my Alatar site right. There we go. This is probably a bit easier. Wait a second. I want a better. Too many control panels up here. There we go. We want this one. That's set up. That's good. We want English Hebrew. Where do we put English Hebrew here? There should be a switch for English Hebrew. There it is, English Hebrew. Actually, we can just do the mission by itself. There we go. But okay. Um, mission Aleph, mission of that. We'll read the English. For what reason don't we don't then bring? For it says the possibly we just quoted. Sharecroppers, renters, okay? Uh, our people took it by violence, it's very good. Um, they don't, they bring, um, that's right. So it says if you rent, you don't bring. That's renting, I'm not sure if you, you know, if renting, what it means if you buy it, you know, it's renting referring to when you when you rent it during the or when or buying it or something different, that we have to see. I have, to, I have to look it up. I'll look it up for next week and we'll find an answer for sure. It was when it says someone renting the land, is he renting it just for a year or two or does he own it? Did he buy it? Or is this renting it for, for a sharecropper? So we have to check that out. Okay, now we're going to go to to Sefer Devarim, chapter 27 with the Klalot. If you look at the Klalot um, in chapter 27, 
Notice they're all things that people do secretly. Okay? Exactly. So we, we curse the person who makes some type of idol worship and puts it and does it secretly. Okay? Somebody who does against some their mother, father, mother in the home, that's more private. Um, hasagat gvul, that's something that people don't see. Hasagat gvul is um, you know, moving your neighbor's thumb marks. That, these are all things you do sneaky, like you, a sneaky thing you do that is, isn't publicly seen. Um, uh, making someone blind or being mis misleading someone blind. Okay? So all types of trickery where you take advantage and no one else is watching you. And including that is someone doing injustice to their Gary of Hamanamana because they can't protect themselves. So you see that it's the same thing. And then Arroyo for sure, things that are done uh, privately. And because of all these things, um, that's why you have so many Arroyo, because Arroyo, you know, <coughs> forbidden relationships, again, that's not something that you do privately in your home and not publicly. And um, for sure taking bribes is something. And, Hitting someone to stay there, not in public, but secretly or in a private area. These are all things that they're not seen by the public eye, and therefore I have to curse them. That even though people don't see you, you need to know you're cursed. So that includes, again, taking advantage of the stranger because it's easy to do and no one will notice it. Okay, so we'll stop that share. And now we go to our last topic for today. Where are we? Share screen. We go to our regular source sheet. Now we get to Brit Savin. Here I sort of, not sure, okay? In Brit Savin, remember Brit Savin is the covenant after the Tokacha, which Moshe makes with the people. And the way we explained it is that Brit Savin is a covenant that the covenant of Mount Sinai is binding for all generations. So it's a covenant about the covenant. Remember, you're standing in front of God, all your leaders, including your children, your wives, the stranger in your midst. So it's everyone's gathered together. And here's that's a stranger who's living in your camp from all different levels of life, you know, from wood drawers, water drawers, and wood shoppers. Okay? Why? To pass you through the breach with Hashem, your God, which he's making with you today. So these are members of the covenant. The question is, if someone's a stranger, but why bring him into the covenant if he's not a covenantal member of society? So it could be he has to be there to hear the laws of his rights, of what we have to give him, etc. Or it could be it might be talking about a stranger who might have um, been included in the meantime. So the manikim that's the core breed of breed Sinai. He'll be our God, will be his people. Um, and then we say this breed is not only with your generation, but with all future generations as well. So if someone says, I don't want to be part of this, it's binding on all generations. So I'm not really sure who this Ger is, but up until now, the Ger in the Varmi has been someone not Jewish. But I'm not sure why would we bring him. Here the wording, Asher Ber Bachanecha, might apply to someone maybe in the process of Gerut, or because remember, we haven't gone to Israel yet. Uh, and maybe someone in, in the meantime, in the 40 years, have, have joined the group. Um, and they need to be there, maybe deciding if they're going to join or not. But for some reason, we invite them uh, for beating Sabin. And the final one is by Hakel. What happens at Hakel? Moshe writes down, every seven years, we have to read the Parsina. So Moshe writes down the Torah, all the laws he just presented, gives it to Kwanim B'nai Levi. Moshe is passing on, and now passes over the job of educational leadership to Sheba Levi, who carried the Avron, who carried the responsibility of teaching the Torah and to the elders. And he tells him, he commands him as follows, every seven years at the end of the Shemitah cycle, when every Israel comes together, circus time, um, to celebrate anyhow, we gather the nation together. Now, look who's obligated in Hakel. Hakel at the Am, gather the nation, the women, the men, the children, and the Gerim Asher B'Sharecha. Now we start altering now and say for Dvarim, <coughs> That's who we give Nevelis to. So he's not Jewish. So why does he have to come to Hakel? So if you read carefully, it's not that he's obligated to come to Hakel. We're obligated to invite him to Hakel. Because remember, my point was when I'm all through the Barim, we have our obligation to the Ger. 
So I don't see this, that the Ger is obligated to come to Hakel. We're obligated to invite him to Hakel. Therefore, Hakel at the Am, Am Yisrael, it's commanded to gather the nation together, including the non-Jews, even the people who have not converted. A, because we have to take care of them. Maybe they have to hear about, if we're going to read in Hakel, the laws of Sefer Devarim, if we read the laws in Devarim and Hakel, they need to know what, what the rights are as well. And maybe we have to see them to know who we have to give to. But when we're going to relive on Mahar Sinai, we want to get in there as well to know who we, have, who we have to take care of because so many laws instead to them relate to the Gera. So I don't think this is the obligation of the Gera to come to Hakel, but rather obligation to invite him to come to Hakel and join us. <coughs> so that everyone learns and learns to fear God. It could be also that we want to know about our God. And we're having this big national celebration, so we want to include them as well. Again, and then either someone who didn't convert, we want everyone to fear God. And when you experience you know, that big gathering, that'll hopefully bring the fear of God into everyone in your community. But that's, that's we covered every single gear in Sefer Devarim, and our time is just about up. So I'll stop here and take questions. But I'm trying to show you, because Sefer Devarim are laws that come with the Ten Commandments about how to build a society, it's not surprising that all through Sefer Dvarim, the Ger is not Jewish. Again, if he, if he converts, it includes someone who converted, but even someone who didn't convert is, um, is included. And therefore, it's just, it's just like we saw in Parshat Mishpatim, and it goes to you, every time we have a long list of laws to deal with our day-to-day -day society, we go out of our way to um, include the Ger and treat him nicely. And... Again, should the Gare remain with us for years, or maybe he goes back to his home, home country, if he goes back and tells people, when I was visiting Israel, when I was a stranger, I was an outsider, they took care of me, they were nice to me, they cared about me, they didn't mistreat me, and he tells that to his people when he goes back home, that in itself can be a sanctification of God's name, and maybe that can set a pattern for other people to learn from. And just for our own, that's for, you know, if he goes back, if he stays in our country, then that's how we take care of the people in our society. I want to clarify something, though. Um, certainly, it only applies to Gerim, again, who didn't convert, but who are not detrimental to society. So if I have a Ger uh, in, our, in our land, a stranger in land, who's an idol worshiper, um, you know, who doesn't follow our laws, who's a terrorist, who hates us, who wants to destroy us, or um, a bad influence, so that's something else we have to, we have to either re-educate them or, or get rid of them or send them away. But that doesn't mean you open up the gates of our country to enemies, but the casual gear, the stranger coming to our country, who it's very easy to take advantage of, we have to go out of the way to be nice to them. Okay. So now we'll take the questions. I'll take from Ruth. Okay, so the gear in the Korean is both convert and stranger. Yeah, that's what I'm saying all along. Whenever it says the gear in the volume, it's not only a non-Jew, but even a non-Jew. And Kabbalah Homer, someone who's Jewish. Again, anyone unfortunate. Um, any other questions? Let's check the chat real fast. Okay, that was this question. Any other questions in, uh, in person? Okay. Uh, yeah, Debbie, you had a question? Yeah, that last one, the explanation of inviting the non-Jew along to Hakel. It seems that it, I always figure Hakel is like a reenactment of Har Sinai and to get us all uh, recommitted to the cause. But it seems to me antithetical to have their people who aren't part of the group. Okay, so uh, I used to, I thought that in the beginning. And I thought about it more. I think that's why it's our job to invite them to come see it. We have this question, do you invite a non-Jew to your Seder, right? So that's a real good question because a Seder, that's our Thanksgiving dinner. That's our, you know, I understand why you might be reluctant, even though it might be okay. You know, whether you can eat Korban Pesach, that's something else, but you can definitely, the halakha says you can eat matzah. You can feed a matzah and more and things like that. That's for sure. The Easter is only on the Korban Pesach because that has a special law, you know, Anyone not circumcised, them not Jewish can't eat it. Um, on the other hand, if we're reliving Har Sinai and there's so many laws at Har Sinai that relate to how we, we how we treat the stranger, 
it's good to see the strange. It's good to invite them. They, again, they don't have to come. I'm saying, I think it's not the obligation of the stranger to come, but it's important for us to, to invite them so we see them. Again, because we want them to see our, they need to know about our laws. They need to know that we have a God who's just and upright. And if they're a stranger, remember, they might go back to the country a year or two or three later. So they'll be amazed by this you know, big experience. But when you come and everyone's there and experience it together, it has an effect on people. And we want the stranger to be a good person also. So maybe his presence in Hakka will make him a better person, who won't become an idol worshiper and things like that. I don't, no, it's, I don't think Har Sinai, it's this big national gathering, but it's not, it's not like Pesach, which is just for us. I don't think it's, uh, it's primarily for us, but I don't think it's detrimental if the Arim come and, and join. The other question I wanted to ask is, do we have any idea how many there were? I mean, it's mentioned so often. Um, is it more of a concept to teach us that yeah, we should have in yeah, mind? Not for sure, or... but remember when we left Egypt, we had a whole era following us. No, did they stay or not? How many stayed on? How many you know, went back before Kriyat Yamsuk? We don't know. But there are definitely people come, you know, when things go well, people come and join us. We might have other runaway slaves from Egypt. You know, we might have started a, a, a pattern. And when, when, when well, you know, there's free food, months falling from the sky. We we'll hear about it, they might come. So it's every, every study has people, strangers coming in, but you have to make sure it doesn't, it doesn't go to the point that that you're that you don't have your own. That identity. it overwhelms. Yeah. Okay. You know, Thank what, you. What, what is that? Two percent for sure is fine. Fifty percent is too much. Somewhere in between, you gotta. You know, that's you know, that's the problem every country has. Yes. Remember, I just show with you. Israel had a very difficult dilemma when the war in Ukraine started. A lot of refugees came. You know, you can't take everybody. So every country took, you know, the quota, whatever they could. The question is, let's say Israel has to take 5,000, 10,000, you know, refugees from Ukraine. That's their equal share, you know, with the European countries. So do we prefer to take Jewish refugees or do we take non-Jewish refugees? Yeah, that's a great dilemma because you have what you call, there's a value in both of them. So, um, there's no right or wrong answer in that, but it's a healthy dilemma that Israel had to face with. And there was a big argument within Israel. Not good because we're Jewish, we should take non-Jewish refugees because, because you know, we suffer from that back before the Holocaust. Or that's what we care about our own first. Remember, Aniyacha, your poor come before the others. So you have conflicting Jewish values, but it's, it's a good dilemma you have to solve. So you have to find a balance between them. The same thing when it says, you know, the Poor people of your community come first. Doesn't mean you don't take care of any other poor people. It's a question of balancing values. Okay. Um, or so let me see the chat. There's another question there. And Jennifer, let me look at the chat now. Okay. Halachot rules to convert nochri to a Oh, what are the halachot of converting a nochri to a ger? A nochri is someone that I think a ger is someone resident in our land. He's living with us. He's a he's a member of our society. A nochri is a tourist. A visitor, a businessman coming by, a stranger. But uh, my my understanding is the gear is someone living with us. He's, he's a member of our community, not a covenantal member, but a civil a member of our civil society. Um, okay, Ilana says it seems like they're gearing in the midbar, and the term precise between them. Well, I didn't wind up with so many midrashim about evil influence of their up. Listen, um, the answer is midrash. In general, um, when you're under persecution. Okay, and you're in survival mode, and people want to convert you, persecute you, et cetera, you need to find the enemy. And in early education, we have find that a lot. So, you know, we're teaching little kids, there's the good guys and the bad guys. So, you know, Batman and Robin, that's that's early education. In older education, you have things like Ham you have like things like Hamlet, where things are more complicated. Sometimes the good guys are bad guys, and bad guys are good guys. It's more complicated when you get older. And that's life. Rabbi, the point I was making about the Nachri and the Geir, is that yeah. attitude or time? No, no, it's just there's a difference between someone who's a member of your civil society, who's living in your land. He's living with you. He's not going back home. He's, you know, he sends his kids to school with like, He's living in our community. Right, so a, is, is it sort of. both attitude and time or just time? No, I think, I think it's, it's time. It's, it's, I think it's how long he's staying with you. 
Uh huh. I'll give you when you file your taxes when you're a thing. So they, if you know, if you're overseas, you know, are you a resident of America or you're a resident of Israel? I know when you file your taxes every year. So you have to have how many months were you in America? How many months you in Israel? So can you claim to be a foreign resident? You have to prove that you've been out of America for at least X amount of days of the year. So, no, right. so it's both thanks. attitude and time. Yeah, time, yeah, for sure. And that's the way it is in American tax law, that's for sure. I forget exactly what the ratio is, but you have to prove that most of the year you're not living in America. Otherwise, you're an American citizen, you have different tax liabilities. But a stranger, you know, a foreigner coming in, same thing with, um, you know, you know who, who has to pay for garbage collection and things like that. So pe people, civil taxes are people living in your country. If you're just a tourist, that's something else. So it might, it might give you a, a tourist tax on things, but you're not, not a regular resident tax. Every, every country, that's not a, that has to do with every country has those uh, dilemmas. Okay. Um, about the laws of the appertain to land ownership. Okay. Yeah, that's, um, that's fine. And any other questions? Okay, moving. And we have a very good week. Um, oh no, I can't get into the uh, not getting into Israeli politics. Okay, <laughs> get too upset. But I have to go now in a minute. Anyhow, um, next week I'll still be in the I'll have a different setup next week. But next week I'm going to do. I might do Hanukkah. I have to talk to Rabbi Jay, or I might do. Uh, I want to do one or two stream before Hanukkah, just because Hanukkah is coming up. Um, or I might go back and we have to do Ger and Shabbat because it's a great Mahbuk, it's just the class in Parshanut, which I want to spend time with. Okay. Nachum, can I just add one last thing? Yeah, sure. The Anochri, which it sounds because it comes from Haker or Naker, so he's un, not recognized. Whereas the Ger is like the old fashioned word sojourner. He's yeah. the, he dwells, he's yeah. there. We're going to read this way, Im Laban Garti, right? Yeah, right. So he wasn't there for a week. He was there for 20 years. Right. But, but, the but, he was, but he's not, that's the beauty. Right. But he was a girl. He's there, but he's a girl. Right. But, he's a girl, he's there, but, he's a girl, but the yeah, Nochri. But, he still, but to the Bnei Chet, he's not, he's not a regular, like Bnei Chet or in Hebron, they own the place. Mm -hmm. And Avram is a girl, but the Even though he's been living there for years. Right. But he doesn't have the same status because he's a foreigner. Right. But the Nochri is like not like from the record, he's not recognizable. A ger is is part of your society. So yeah. you recognize him, you yeah. know. I'm not sure if the Nochri is gonna say anything negative. No, not well, it's yeah. just like if you want to make a, a, a division between ger versus nochri, you okay, might... that's what the word means. Someone like not 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 you not you don't see him every week and you don't bump into him in the call it every day. Or in the uh nowadays in the <laughs> Okay. Okay. Anyway, so everyone have a good week, and uh, we'll see you next week. Bye bye. Well, let me turn off the recording. Well, Rabbi, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank Very you. Well. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Okay. Have a good week, everybody. Thanks. Thank you too. See you soon.